and welcome to our service this morning, those that are here and those that are joining online as well. We're glad you have joined us today, and our prayer is, as I've mentioned before, that you will be challenged and you will be encouraged as we sing and open up God's Word today. One, well, two announcements. Uh, as we begin this morning, and that is, uh, Paul wanted me to highlight uh, Monday to Friday, 6.30 p.m., the week of prayer on Zoom. So just to highlight that for you, and then two birthdays. One would be my wife's, because she's older than me. So I just highlight that for you. That's on Wednesday, and then Lois Tabor's birthday is on Thursday, so we have a chance to, uh, to let her... Uh, have some congratulations, then uh, you can certainly do that. Hymn number 189 in our hymn books, please, or on the screen, 189. Let's stand as we sing, if you are able. Hallelujah. your hymn books to 193. God is so good. We'll remain seated for this.
And that's one of those songs that could just continue to go on and on and on. We get at chorus after chorus after chorus, and it would all be true. Good morning. It's good to have you all with us. I trust you all had a good week. Some heads are going yes, okay. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, we got lots of things to pray for, so let's take some time and go before the throne of grace. Father in heaven, again, we do count it a joy and a privilege to be here this morning with your people. And Lord, we just pray that as we are here this morning, that we would be encouraged by one another, that we would be strengthened, that we'd be loved. And Lord, whatever need we have this morning, we bring it before you, asking that you would meet whatever need that is. Lord, we know some people are grieving the loss of a loved one. Um, some are away, some are working, some are not feeling well today, Father. We just bring them before your throne of grace. And Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to do that. You tell us in your most precious word that we can come with boldness before your throne of grace in the time of need through Christ Jesus. So we thank you so much for that. We thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, you are truly faithful to us as individuals and also as a corporate body. And Lord, we have that promise in your word that great is your faithfulness. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness toward us. <clears throat> Lord, you are so good to us as we just sang. God is so good and you care for us. And that is so, so true. So Lord, we thank you for being a caring, loving, awesome God. And Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us. It's, a, it's an unconditional type of love. You don't say, I love you if you do this or if you do that. You just say, I love you. And you prove that love by sending your only begotten son into this world to come to this earth, to live here, to ultimately die on that cross. But you died for a reason. And that was for us. The Bible tells us that Jesus died for our sin according to the scriptures and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Lord, that is what we, we strive to base everything on, what your word says. We thank you for your word, that we have it in our hands to study, to meditate on, to delight in. So Father, in a little while, when we look into your word, we ask your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us, that you would encourage us this morning through your word. Lord, we all probably need encouragement some way or another, and that is found in you and in your word, Father. Lord, we think this morning of those who are on our list. Um, there are many people there. Again, we bring before you Shelley and Logan and Keith. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would just show yourself to them in a mighty way, that through this battle with cancer that Shelley is having, that it would strengthen their faith, it would increase their trust in you. And Lord, that they would rely completely on you. Lord, I thank you for the so many people who are praying for them. And I thank you that we see you working. And she's been having some good days. And Lord, we praise you for that. But amongst those good days are also days that aren't so good. So just give them the grace, the peace that they need at this time. And Lord, thank you for meeting their needs. Uh, they need a lot of things for uh, the house and you have provided. Uh, now they're gonna be traveling back and forth to Moncton almost daily for chemo treatments. So that's gonna involve a lot of gas money and such. And we know that you will continue to provide. So we thank you for the doctors that are looking after her and for the treatments that they're gonna do. Lord, we just pray that these treatments will help. And Lord, we do pray your will be done. And if your will is just to touch her body and relieve her of her cancer, we ask that that would be done. We know that you can do it because we have seen it done in the past. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we put this family into your hands this morning. Lord, we think of Pauline and Terry Ward as well. Just continue to work in them. Lord, we think of uh, our brother Bruce. Thank you for him and Kathy being here this morning. Lord, just continue to encourage them. And Lord, just bless them with, with good health and watch over them, Father. And we think of Carl Amos this morning. Lord, um, you know what's going on in his life physically. Lord, just be with him. Just give the doctors wisdom 
in discernment and how to go forward with, with what's going on. And Lord, we just put him before your throne of grace this morning. And there are so many others that are on our list and those that aren't on our list, but you know what their, their needs are. We bring them before you this morning. Lord, we think of our missionaries this morning scattered throughout the world. Lord, you have called them there. They have obeyed you and went. Uh, they are serving you and they're seeing fruit for their labors all around the world. And Lord, we are just so thankful that we can be part of that through supporting them financially and prayerfully. So continue to use them, allow them to see uh, people come to know you and people that would be disciples and people that would serve you, Father. So just bless them and meet whatever needs that they have. So Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us. And we look forward to seeing what you're gonna do in the days ahead. And Lord, we also look forward to the day when you come to take us home. And Lord, what a day that's gonna be. But until then, there's work to be done. So work in us and through us, we ask in Jesus' most precious name, amen. If you have your Bibles for our scripture reading this morning, go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 1 through 9. So Joshua chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Joshua 1 verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to thee, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, to do according to all, oh, I said that, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. This is the word of God. Let's take a few moments and just greet one another in love.
while you're making your way to your seats, 353 in our hymn books, please. 353, also on screen, Victory in Jesus. And I know you just stood and sat. Now you're going to ask me to stand again if you could. seated. I know it said back row boys in the bulletin. Well, you were all honorary back row boys this morning, seeing one of our members was lounging on some tropical island somewhere. When I did the bulletin, I forgot Malcolm was going to be away. So I was thinking the other day, well, maybe it will be a congregational hymn. And then David emailed me and, what do you think? I said, I was thinking that already. And then I think it was Jim that texted me and said, are we singing? And I typed in, Malcolm is away, so it will be a congregational hymn. But you know how autocorrect throws things in. And it said, Malcolm is awesome. And we won't be singing. So I had to correct and said, I meant to say Malcolm was away, not awesome. But I guess in a way, Malcolm is pretty awesome. But uh, he is away, enjoying himself. Um, I forget where Barbados or somewhere. Um, so they're having a good time by the looks of pictures so far. 
So I'm at the point where just stop sending pictures. You know, we don't need to see any more of this stuff when we are here and it's minus 15 and everything else. But anyway, and uh, I haven't picked on my wife from here for a little while. So I thought today would be the day. A few weeks ago, I was at MBBI at the Men for God rally. She knows where I'm going with this. And I ran into Pastor Doherty. By the way, Pastor Doherty sends greetings to everyone. And I ran into Pastor Cantway. And he sends greetings to, know, to those that know him. But they both said, tell Betty Lynn we said hi. So I said to Betty Lynn the other day, I said, oh, by the way, Pastor Doherty and Pastor Cantway said hello. And then she insulted me. Oh, my two favorite pastors. And I'm just sitting in the car like, huh? So, yes, she backpedaled and it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> so, if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 1. We'll be looking at the portion of Scripture that we read this morning, or we're going to attempt to anyway. And we're looking at... God giving Joshua his commission and his command. And what we have here is an, an, it's a change of guard, I guess you can say. Uh, Moses is now dead, which we will look at in a few moments. So the new leader is on the scene, Joshua. And what Joshua needed the most was encouragement. And God gives him the encouragement that he needs. And that's what chapter 1 is all about, encouragement. And I found that it is a great chapter for us today because don't we all need encouragement once in a while? So here we're going to see in this whole chapter, we're going to see God encouraging Joshua, Joshua encouraging the people, the people encouraging jo uh, Joshua, and us being encouraged by it all. So over the next several weeks, Lord willing, we'll be looking at how People are being encouraged and how that can apply to us in the crazy world that we live in today and all the things that are going on around us today. We need encouragement. And God is going to give this encouragement to us because he says over and over and over, as he said to Moses, I will be with thee, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So we know that he is with us no matter what is going on in this world today. No matter what you're going through in life today, he is with you and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Amen? Never. Ever. And that's a promise from God. And as we looked at in Sunday school this morning, we looked at the doctrine of hope. And we hope, which means we have this confidence in the promises of God. We can believe every promise that he made will be fulfilled because that's what God does. I've made promises before and I'm pretty sure I probably broke promises before. We probably all have. But God makes promises and he never, ever, ever breaks them. So here he says, be strong and of a good courage. Then he says, I'm with you. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. So God gives Joshua encouragement as he gives Joshua his commission and his command. He says, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. This is what you need to do. But along the way, remember, I'm with you. I'm with you wherever you go. So be encouraged. In Joshua the first 12 chapters, we see that they enter into the promised land. Then chapter 13 to 21, which we will get to eventually, we see that the land is divided. The land is divided into the portions that Joshua gives to all the tribes. And then this book concludes with the final message of Joshua to his people. As we looked at, if you remember when we were spending a couple of weeks in the introduction, the great theme of this book is possession. 
possession. And in this first chapter, we will see what is meant by that. So this chapter opens up with the Lord God personally giving Joshua his commission and his command. So look at verse 1. Joshua 1 verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, look at that first word, now. The word now, according to scholars and translators and such, should be translated and. And it connects to the final chapter of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 34. The word and is a connective. And the minute a speaker says the word and, he or she must keep on talking. Because and connects something that has gone before with something that is coming. So it would be pretty weird if I'm preaching up here and then I said, and, and I don't say another word. It would be pretty weird for me to say, Betty Lynn said that they were her two favorite pastors, and, and I stop. That word and connects something before to something that is coming ahead. And this supports the theory that Deuteronomy chapter 34 was written by Joshua. Even if the death of Moses is remembered by someone else. Folks, the scriptures are very clear that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. That Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. That's not being debated. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Holding to Moses being the author of the Pentateuch, however, it poses an interesting question. Who wrote about Moses' death? in Deuteronomy 34. Or in other words, who wrote the eulogy for Moses? Did Moses write his own eulogy? Probably not. So who wrote it? So over the centuries, biblical scholars and commentators have differed over who wrote Deuteronomy 34. For example, Jewish tradition cites that Joshua wrote chapter 34. In his commentary, John Calvin acknowledges the probable conjuncture of the ancients that Joshua wrote Deuteronomy 34. But he also says that Eleazar the priest may have wrote Deuteronomy 34. Joshua is the most likely candidate. Most commentators and Jewish traditions agree. A fellow by the name of John Peter Lang, he points out that it is clear from Joshua's command in Joshua 1.8, which we just read, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, you should meditate on a day and night, etc. That is the same writer that is writing these things. Joshua did meditate and practice the Word of God. Joshua served, did he not, as Moses' minister or Moses' servant since his youth? So he likely grew up loving God's word while serving Moses. 
evidence also gives, or scripture also gives evidence of Joshua's literary activity in Deuteronomy 31. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 31, and we'll start at verse 14. Deuteronomy 31, 14. It says this, Deuteronomy 31, 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua, and present yourself in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a church. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither thou go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenants which I made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come among us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in the day from all the evils which thou um, shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Verse 19, Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. So here we see Mo, or Joshua is commissioned to write this to the people, who were rebelling against God. And in Joshua chapter 24, verses 19 to 28, we won't turn there because we'll eventually get there, we see again Joshua is writing things to the people of Israel. Although God could have communicated the account of Moses' death and burial to any person, could have been Joshua, could have been Eliezer the priest, it could have been anybody. But a simple reading of Deuteronomy 34 seems to point to Joshua as being the author. While a compelling case can be made for the authorship of Deuteronomy 34, we're really not certain who wrote it. Right? We're just speculating who may have wrote it. And many people follow Calvin's wise advice and leave, as Calvin says, leave the matter of no very great importance undecided. So it's most likely Joshua wrote it, but when it comes down to the scheme of things, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So what I want to do this morning is read Deuteronomy 34 because that leads us into Joshua 1. And I have a few comments that we will look at um, as we go through Deuteronomy 34. So let's read it. Deuteronomy 34 verse 1, it says, And Moses went up upon the plains of Moab onto the mountain of Nebo to the plain of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Neptali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zar. The Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died 
there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, over against Beth Horah. But no man knoweth his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plain of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hand upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of Israel. So Moses had seen the land. He saw the land. And we see that Moses died on Mount Nebo and was buried by the Lord in a secret place. And nobody knows where that is as of today. I believe the reason that the Lord buried Moses in a secret place was to keep the people from making a shrine to the lawgiver, to Moses. And worshiping him. Because as we looked in Hebrews, Jesus is better or superior than Moses. And we're to worship Jesus and not Moses or any of the prophets. We see Moses was 120 years old when he died. Anybody around 120? Oh, Bruce put his hand up. Moses was 120 years old. But listen to his description. He was still strong. He was still alert. His eyes were still good. And he was keen. I hit 40, and I had to start wearing these things. But his eyes were good. He was strong. He was in good health. So why wasn't Moses allowed to go into the promised land? He was strong enough. He was keen enough. He was alert enough to take the people into the land. The reason Moses could no longer lead the people wasn't a physical reason. It was a spiritual one. God told him that because of his sin and his disobedience that he would not lead the people into the promised land. If we were to take the time to read um, Numbers chapter 20, we would see what took place. He sinned because he disobeyed God. God said, say to the rock, and he'll give water. But Moses was upset with the people, so he struck the rock with his rod twice. Did God say strike the rock? Not this time. He did in the past. This time he said, just talk to the rock, speak to the rock. But Moses hit the rock, struck the rock twice. And one of the things you'll notice if you read Numbers 20 is that him and Aaron took credit for the water. We gave you water. No, you didn't. God gave the water even though you disobeyed him. Because when he struck the rock, the water still came. But they disobeyed. And Moses was now, you're not going to enter the promised land because of your sin and because of your disobedience. That must have been a hard blow for Moses, wouldn't it? He led the people out of Egypt. 
He was the leader. He's standing there. He can see the land. Tap, tap, tap by God. Hey, Moses, you're not going to enter. You're not going to enter the land because of your disobedience and your sin. That must have been a blow to him. Because of your sin. You're physically able to do it. But spiritually, you're not. Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, Joshua assumed his duty as commander-in-chief. Moses had confirmed Joshua as his successor, according to the word of the Lord. And Moses' servant became his successor. And this was sort of a, more of Moses' humility. The guy that grew up with me, the guy that I'm training, he's going to be the guy that gets to take the people into the promised land. Well, that's not fair. But Moses listened to God and said, he's the guy. And Moses told the people, he's the guy. He's going to lead you. Follow him. And the people agreed. And then in verse 10 to 12, the last part of this section a few men who could pay tribute to Moses, Joshua would be one. But these verses were written, and the Messiah had not yet appeared. Because look what it says in verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And we know that's true because he met with God several times. Of course, when the closing verses were written, the Messiah had not yet appeared. So verse 10 was only true until the time of Christ's first advent. And then he met prophets after his birth. He met John the Baptist, who was a prophet. So this was before his birth. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, and Moses verily, or truly, was faithful in all his house as a servant. Because of his sin, he died, and his burial is not known. His burial place. But his antitype, the Lord Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, listen to what it says. The Lord Jesus was faithful as a son over his own house. It was for our sins that he died. That's what the Bible says. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He's different than Moses because Jesus' burial place is empty. Moses' burial place is unknown, but Moses is still there. Jesus' burial place is empty. Why is it empty? Because he arose, as the Scriptures say. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he ascended to the right, right, hand, or ascended to the right hand of majesty. He ascended to the right hand of God in heaven. Hebrews chapter 3 Verse 1 and 3 says this, Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. So here in verse uh, chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, we see Moses' eulogy. And that brings us back to Joshua chapter 1. After Moses' eulogy, we see in verse 1, now, which should be translated end, 
And after the death of Moses, okay, so we, we, we hear about the death of Moses. And then Joshua says, and after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, and in verse 2 we read, Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. And as we have seen, Moses was not essential to leading the children of Israel into the land. Moses was really not essential. In fact, he could not bring them into the land. He couldn't do it. Moses represented the law. Correct? Moses represented the law. The law cannot save us. Cannot save us. The law is a revealer. It's not a redeemer. The law shows us how crooked we are. But the law cannot save us. It can't. The law shows us that we are sinners. The law shows us that we need a Savior. But the law can't be that Savior. Praise the Lord appoints us to the one who can. Moses could not lead Israel because of his failure, because of his sin. The problem was not with the law. The problem was with Moses. And the problem is with us. Because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the law reveals. That we have fallen short of the glory of God. That's why the scripture says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Only Jesus, our Savior, our Joshua, can lead us into the place of blessing that he has for us. Only Jesus can save us from our sin. No one else can. The law can't. I can't. No priest can. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can save a person from their sin. Acts 4.12 tells us, Neither is there any salvation among, neither is there any name given among men whereby ye must be saved. There's no other name. John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but by me. No one. And people will debate with us on that verse. Jesus doesn't really mean that there's only one way to heaven. Well, folks, yes, he does. No, no, no. He's just saying that he's one of the ways. If Jesus was just one of the ways to heaven, then that would make God a monster. Wouldn't it? That he put his own son to death as one of the ways that we could be saved. But praise God, he's not a monster. He's a loving, gracious, merciful, forgiving God that will save anybody that cries out to him. Anyone who believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, will be saved. That's his promise. And as we already looked at, he keeps his promises. He keeps them. Joshua 1 2, this verse tells us the land was given to Israel. Israel's ownership was unconditional, 
God promised it to Abraham. God promised it to his offspring. And God reaffirmed that promise over and over and over again in the book of Genesis. He promised it. And then we get into the book of Deuteronomy, and God made the Palestinian covenant with Israel, which gave them the land as an everlasting possession. The land is theirs. No matter what anybody says today, no matter what the government says today, the land is Israel's. And not just the land that they occupy, but much, much more. Because God made a covenant with them. This land is yours. So whoever says, no, it's not, or whoever says, well, let's have a two-state land agreement, no, the land belongs to Israel, right from the mouth of God. The land is theirs. So we should be encouraged here. Because God made a promise to them that the land would be theirs as an everlasting possession. So the promises that he made to us, he is going to fulfill. That should encourage us today. He will fulfill every promise that he's made. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So now in verse 2, we see the command. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now Joshua, arise. Go over this Jordan. Now arise. Go over this Jordan. May we not only be saved from, but be saved to. May we not only be saved from sin. That makes us safe in Christ. But may we be saved to holiness. May we, may we be saved to holiness. This makes us happy in Christ. May we realize our completeness in Jesus. We're complete in him, Colossians tells us. May we realize our completeness in him this day and cease from our wanderings of fear. Israel wandered the wilderness for 40 years. 11-day trip. 40 years because of their disobedience. There's a lot of Christians who are wandering today who are wandering in fear. They see what's going on in the world. They see what the news is saying. They're seeing this, they're seeing that, and they're fearful. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about things, but we do not need to fear. We don't need to fear, because God is with us whithersoever we go. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Never ever. Charles Spurgeon said this, it is time we took possession of that goodly heritage the Lord has made our one. For in Christ we have obtained an inheritance and have the guarantee of it in our possession of the Spirit of God. We have lingered long enough in the wilderness. That's so true. We have lingered long enough in the wilderness. Let's claim the inheritance that God has promised us. He's promised us all spiritual blessings. And we'll look at them next week, Lord willing. So Joshua was encouraged from God's commission, and he was encouraged by God's command. He's the new leader. A wise leader 
doesn't completely abandon the past or what the past leader had built on. We don't abandon what those who came before us do. We remember and we build on it. Joshua didn't say, Yahoo, I'm the commander. Forget about everything Moses said and did. Let's do it my way. No. He still had respect for Moses. Moses is mentioned 57 times in the book of Joshua. That's evidence that Joshua still respected Moses and what he had done for Israel. Now God is saying, you're going to build on what Moses did. You're going to lead these people into the land that I have promised them as an everlasting possession. You're going to do this, and I'm going to be with you just like I was with Moses. So he was encouraged. Joshua worshipped the same God that Moses worshipped. He obeyed the same word, God's word, that Moses gave to Israel. So this new leader was still continuing to do the same things that God told Moses to do. God commissioned, and we'll finish it with this, God commissioned Joshua to do three things. Lead the people into the land. Isn't that what he commissioned him? Yes. Now therefore go, arise, go over this Jordan, and all this people onto the land which I did give unto them, even to the children of Israel. So God's commission was lead the people into the land. Second commission was defeat the enemy. Don't live with them. Don't hang out with them. Don't worship the gods that they worship. Defeat them. And thirdly, claim the inheritance. Claim the land that I have promised you. Claim it. When we get to verse 3, it says, Every piece that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Claim the inheritance. God could have sent an angel to do that, couldn't he? He could have sent an angel to lead the people in the land. He could have sent an angel to defeat the enemy. He could have sent an angel to claim the inheritance. But he chose to use a man and give him the power that was needed to get the job done. So God has a commission for us. And he gives us the power to do the job that he's called us to do. Go ye into all the world and teach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, or some translations say, to the end of the world, to the end of the age. That's our commission. And he gives us the power to do it. He gives us the power to do it. As we already looked at, Joshua is a type of Jesus, the captain of our salvation. He has won the victory. And now he shares that spiritual inheritance with us. How awesome is that? He shares his inheritance with you and I. So God encourages Moses with this commission and command. And he encourages us to do his will. He encourages us to do what he has called us to do. And this chapter, as I said, is all about encouragement. And who doesn't need to be encouraged? Especially by God. It's one thing for me or you to encourage someone, but it's a whole different thing when it's God that's encouraging. And he's encouraging us today. I am with you. I will never leave you. I have given you the power to accomplish the job that I've called you to do. Be of a good courage.
don't be afraid. I think that's awesome. It's awesome. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you and praise you for being a great, awesome God. And Lord, we don't use that word awesome lightly. We are in awe of who you are. And thank you for the encouragement that we got from you this morning from your word. That no matter what we're going through in life, no matter what life throws our way, we know that you are with us. That you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. You tell us, as you told Joshua, don't be afraid. Be of a good courage. And thank you for giving us that courage. So as we leave this place this morning, may we leave excited that we can go and do what you called us to do. Because we know, as we probably already knew before today, that you give us the power to accomplish what you call us to do. So help us to do that. And help us not to linger in the wilderness of fear. Because you tell us over and over, fear not, for I am with you. So we have really no reason to fear. For someone here or someone listening online who doesn't know you, may they claim that promise today. If they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will be saved. So speak to their hearts, Father. Convince them of their need of a Savior, which is Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. So as we leave this place, bring us to our destination safely. May we have a great afternoon and draw us back together tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a closing hymn, number 235. If you are able, let's stand. Take the name of Jesus with you.
Amen. God bless you.